Hey everybody, welcome to Screen Awesome, my name is Eric, and the reason why I'm making this video today is because there's a lot of questions, comments, and concerns about my uh, Historians Review The Last Tiger video, and so that was my pop most popular video to date, and so I got a lot of questions for you guys, so I kind of want to respond to those. Um, so I was going to make this video a lot earlier, um, I'd first made it a couple weeks uh, before this, or a couple days before this, and I really didn't like it, and had to get a bunch of stuff done for school and things of that nature. Um, but now we're here, finally, and uh, hopefully it's better than what I tried to do before. So before I begin answering questions, I'd like to give a little background about myself, and a little insight into what my mindset is when I'm reviewing uh, these types of popular media based on history. And I hope all this information will kind of clear up some confusion and complaints that some of you had on this video, and maybe future videos kind of similar to this. And I'll try to make this as like coherent as possible in a sense, so you guys can understand where I'm going with all this stuff. I would also like to note that I have notes on my computer screen, so if I'm kind of looking down, I'm looking at notes, and that'll kind of allow me to make a better uh, uh, coherent uh, argument in a sense. And so hopefully you guys are not bothered by that. So let's get into it. Um, so first off, uh, my background. So uh, I will first say that I am not an expert on the military history of the Second World War. Um, but my main uh, research interests lie in, uh, or research expertise you can say, uh, lies in warfare uh, of the 18th and 19th century, and also guerrilla warfare as well, just as, as like a, a main idea in a sense, just like as a term throughout, not a term, but as a concept of conducting war. And if we're to go more deeper into that, I would say that my expertise lie in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Um, and then I did my research as an undergrad at UC Davis um, in uh, the Peninsular War. So in my research, I kind of looked at why uh, certain Spanish political figures, uh, or more, more specifically uh, liberal Spanish political figures, uh, decided to join uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And why did some decide to join uh, the Spanish uh, cause or the Spanish resistance? So that was like my main area of research. And then... Um, the reason why, I, or if we're to go like a little more deeper into that, in a sense, um, basically, um, uh, Spanish liberals uh, they had uh, certain ideas, or basically liberals. Um, Napoleon kind of created this more of a liberal uh, mindset, even though he was a conqueror. He also had like a liberal, a lot of liberal uh, policies, and so there's a lot of um, certain policies that Spanish liberals could have uh, enjoyed from Napoleon Bonaparte. So some of them did join because of those reasons. And others um, did not feel that Napoleon um, actually represented those ideas, or they had their own reasons for why they didn't, and so they decided to join the uh, Spanish cause. So my research kind of looked at, um, you know, the motivations behind those things. So then I took my research, which was about uh, 60 pages or so of original research, and you're probably seeing like bits and pieces of what I mean by that. And what I did is I took that and turned it into about a 15-page uh, article titled uh, Why They Fight, a Reanalysis of the Motivations Behind Insurgencies. And right now I'm currently in the process of getting that published, so hopefully I'll have an update for you if when that happens, or if it does happen. Um, and then if we were to look at uh, wars, if we, so that's kind of like my background or expertise uh, in terms of history. Um, but I will say that um, when it comes to the Second World War, or other wars, um, I'm particularly interested in the social and political effects that those wars have happened, that those wars had uh, on those items, on those concepts. So if we were to look at the Second World War, um, just as an interest of mine, I would say I'm very interested of the uh, political and social effects of the total war that occurred in the Second World War. I would say that's something that I really get an enjoyment or interested in, because that kind of fits into what I'm kind of want to do as a uh, graduate student. So that's kind of like my background and kind of what I, what my background in this history. And this background kind of really feeds into like my mindset when I'm kind of reviewing these types of um, popular media based on history. And so kind of my mindset when I was going to review The Last Tiger, um, one of the things I was focusing on is uh, what was Dice trying to create with this war story? Uh, was it a, was he trying to recreate a realistic uh, World War II shooter? Or was it a commentary on human nature and how people deal with traumatic events? Um, and so I believe that Dice was really trying to create the latter. So what their commentary was on human nature and how people deal with uh, traumatic events. And so for me, I was really trying to focus in on these pretty much, I was pretty much judging how Dice kind of went about, um, you know, developing or basically developing and then finally delivering on these uh, themes and arguments. And so if they were really trying to, um, you know, really try to create a realistic shooter where, 
you know, they had the right weapons, um, not the right weapons, but like um, basically the, t the guns were being used the correct manner or the fact that, um, you know, they had certain tanks on the battlefield at the right time or, you know, the tactics that were, were used. If they were trying to do that, I would have been more fucking, I would have been more, um, you know, focus on those items or maybe try to focus on both but i would also say that it's very difficult when you're dealing with you're trying to play a video game and also com you know commentate on these items so my so for me it was a lot easier to uh and more not only not only easier but i think it was just more interesting to me and just kind of how i think um you know trying to get these things that are like below the surface in a sense and i'll I have i'll touch on that a little bit more um so that was kind of like my mindset. That was a part of my mindset going into this video. So another item that really affected my mindset going into this video was this article by the University of Sheffield. Um, this article is titled Meet the Historical Expert Lauren Turcotte on Assassin's Creed Unity. So Lauren Turcotte, who is a professor of uh, history at the University de Quebec at Trois-Rivières, I don't know, my French is not really that good, who specializes in leisurely, leisure activity and space in 18th century Paris, He's also wrote a bunch of books. Um, he was one of the historical consultants on Assassin's Creed Unity. So um, I kind of get, I'll, I'll read what things that kind of jump out in this interview, and I'll, then I'll tell you guys um, how this affected my viewpoint when I was reviewing The Last Tiger. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, I guess a uh, left-wing French politician said that the game was a smear against the revolution because the violent representation of the revolutionaries and rose pierre and the positive depiction of the royal family uh what do you th what you think of this this was a question as to lauren Ducat. and so he says a bunch of things but um this is his this is part of his response to the question uh when it comes to games in history at a certain point you've got to know how to negotiate and that's the real difficult in public history between the time you have to produce the product and the historical debates you want to respond to there are plenty of elements in the game that can be subject to debate. Let's not forget that history is made up of holes. The game is riddled with them. So before this, um, he was talking about how, like, on the surface, in terms of, like, if we were to look at Assassin's Creed Unity, in a sense, um, he basically talked about, like, there's a lot, of, not only, like, um, how certain figures are depicted, in a sense, within the game, but also there's, like, um, he talked about in the article how, like, um, there's like certain types of clothing that are worn by the wrong uh basically status in society like basically like if you're a poor person you wouldn't wear that type of hat or if you're a rich noble you wouldn't wear that type of dress you know those types of things and so uh and i'll kind of go back to this i'll kind of come back to this in a little bit and so uh in the next question he says uh, he's asked is um what are your thoughts on the connection between this kind of popular culture and history um, can players actually learn history from the game, or is it just a backdrop? He says, I plan on using the game to help my students understand the shock and emotion that the major events of the revolution would have provoked and to visualize 18th century Paris. It's an important teaching tool that universities could use to explore the daily life of the period and the physiognomy of the city, so much of which was destroyed by Haussmann in the 19th century. So how did, the, how did this interview kind of affect my... I guess you can say my judgment, not my judgment, but the things I decided to pick out in my, in my video. So a lot of the questions and comments that I was getting on this video was picking out a lot of, a lot of these service elements, um, like, um, you know, the, that tank, or uh, basically I'm trying to um, comprehend what was being said, but like, you know, why did the tank do that thing? Like, that's something that German uh, tank commanders would not have been taught or something like that. Or, um, why wasn't there this type of tank in that thing? Or, um, you know, just, just or like, um, you know, that gun wasn't around or something like that. I don't know. Just these little surface elements things. And I'll kind of go more deeper on that on, on, in a little bit, in it shortly. Um, but, like... My mindset going into this game is that I knew those types of service elements were going to be wrong because it is a video game and then it is like entertainment. So they're going to do things. They're going to make it like make things entertain entertaining for the for the general populace. Because if they were going to try to implement some of those items within the game, um, I think they believe that a large uh, majority of the population or the people who play games would not enjoy those types of, those types of systems or I guess, um, 
you know, those types of imagery, and some of those things are done to portray a certain image or to for gameplay reasons. Um, so they believe that that won't be um, like either appealing or like amusing for most people, and it will only be amusing for me, people like me and other people who probably comment on this video. So for me, I felt like I was, um, I felt like it was also kind of like a waste of energy in a sense, because I knew those things were not gonna, those a lot of those things were gonna be wrong. But to get to to Battlefield Five's credit, a lot of a lot of things in terms of the weapons and how they look and um the equipment itself like how it's how everything kind of is modeled and everything is actually pretty good it's um it's actually pretty historically um correct and so and also connected to that as well like i said before i also felt like that's not like the most interesting item of what's being portrayed to us to the viewer and also i don't think that's what dice is really trying to do so that's why i really didn't pick up on a lot of those things in addition to the fact that um, it was really hard to pick up on everything when you're trying to play a very, uh, you know, intense video game. And these things kind of feed in into kind of like my opinion on like military history in general. So, um, like I said before, a lot of the comments that I was getting um, was a lot of these service elements, like, you know, the weapons being used in the wrong way or there wasn't a correct sight on that gun or there wasn't a correct sight on that weapon or things of that nature. Or that, you know, the tactics, you know, Germans are not using the correct tank tactics and things of that nature. Now, this is my opinion on just mil military history, maybe history in general. So I know many historians who have different viewpoints on this thing. But this is kind of what I've kind of come up with and kind of what I've kind of seen and experienced while being within, like, around historians and taking taking history classes at a, at a tier one university. Um, first off, I would say that, um, a lot of those service elements that we're, that we're talking about, and I know those tactics, you know, the military surface elements, like the tactics, the types of weapons that are being used, or type of, um, the gun that's on a tank or things of that nature, I feel like, uh, those things, um, don't really do much for the general person. Now, if you're somebody who is involved in the development of military tactics or weapons or how these weapons are employed like if you're working at a uh if you're if you're at a you know military college or you're um talking to a bunch of officers who are learning how to use these new weapons and things of that nature i would say that those things are super important to those people because that that's something that they're going to um actually be involved with is um you know being involved in war and things of that nature. But I feel like there's things that a lot of people are not, that are kind of missing in that how can these stories, or how can like, you know, these stories and how can they kind of inform the general person? So if I was to kind of use my own research as a starting off point of this conversation, um, for me, one thing I like to research in graduate school, or something that I'm going to try to uh, research in graduate school, is the possible effects that the violence and total war of the peninsula had on the creation of Spanish nationalism and the Spanish citizens. And the reason why I think this is important, something that's something that should be kind of um, looked at just from a, like an own personal view, um, I would say that um, by examining the effects of guerrilla warfare that took place during the peninsula war, and the creation of Spanish nationalism and Spanish citizenship. Um, this line of questioning may lead to the discovery of different levels or intensities of political ideas that permeated to other nations outside of the Spanish context. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking military history, but I'm taking out of it lessons that can kind of inform the general person. While I do have to deal with um, tactics and things that nature like i have to know these things it's not like the most important part it just may inform certain like uh to give an example like uh the french burned villages um as a military tactic to um basically root out gorillas i have to know that but then i just can't say that 
or be like, that's cool. What are you going to do with that information? I can say that that type of action by the French soldiers um, impacted the way in which that community saw, um, you know, basically more deepened, I guess, Spanish nationalism in a sense, or impacted their view of what it meant to be Spanish. You know, that, that's the thing I had to discover when I actually do research, when I go deeper into that. So that's what I mean by these surface elements being used to describe much broader and more um, something that someone in the general populace can actually use as a um, piece of knowledge to understand themselves and the world around them. While the, most people don't really care about what type of gun was on a tank because what is it really going to do for them? And before I go on further, I would say that I, I, I kind of went deeper into this on another video. You probably see it over here. So check that out if you guys want to go more deeper into that. Um, so in that sense, I feel like people are kind of missing out what we can actually use military history for. Or when we're looking at this, what can um, we really get from it from a general? Like, how can we use this information to kind of better understand ourselves and maybe humans in general? And then this opinion is um, shared by a... Uh, a historian that I really um, enjoy reading from and is someone who's really informed me a lot on my own research. His name is Charles Esdale. And in his book um, titled The Peninsular War, A New History, he, in his pre preface, he kind of talks about this a little bit. Um, he says on the Peninsular War, um, based on his historiography of the Peninsular War, he says, after all, in Britain, France, and Portugal, and Spain alike, a series of imposing histories of the war have been published that appear to leave little room for anything other than uh, deprivated pot boilers. Basically, they don't really do much for, they're just, they, they're pot boilers. All they do is boil, essentially. In fact, a fresh work is sorely needed. Part of the problem is that, such, is that this great weight of historiography now shows its age very badly. As old history written very much in terms of battles and campaigns and great men, it is blind to the fresh currents of historical work that for at least 50 years have been, revolutionizing, uh, have been revolutionizing our understanding of the past. A review of the historiography of the Peninsula War suggests that there is a strong need to pull the military and political treatments of the society together. War and politics go hand in hand. So essentially what he's saying is that like military history cannot exist like in a vacuum. And if you kind of do this, you kind of miss, at least from uh, Esdale's point of view, you kind of miss um, a lot of lessons that can be learned from this history. And you get a more well-rounded understanding of the event or the military history event in this case and it just betters everybody and you get to do more with it so what i'm essentially saying is so if i was just to kind of um to kind of review everything i just said before i would say that while it is important these you know these surface elements I would say that that's not something that people should be hung up on um, because it is popular media in a sense that it's going to do things to kind of create entertainment. But I think that's something, what, something, that's something that should be kind of like focused on is what are they trying to do with that popular media? Is it – if they're trying to tell a story like in the – basically with all the war stories or with the um, – Last Tiger specifically, you know, they're trying to talk about what it must have felt like to be a German soldier near the downfall of the Second World War. You know, what did that feel like? You know, you know, are all humans subject to this? You know, what does it feel like to be a human in that type of situation? You know, what is human, um, uh, what is human like nature? You know, I feel like not only is that, I feel like not only. That's more complicated, which is, and it's interesting. It's something that you can actually use, knowledge you can actually use for your everyday life. And I feel like that's something that should really be focused on when you're looking at things produced in history. Um, now, I will say that it, it, it's super awesome when they're able to get these surface elements, you know, the, I forget the word that's used, but if they can get that down, like that's that's cool if they can mirror those things together. That's that makes for a great you know um, history based um, book or movie or things of that nature. You know what I'm saying? And like a good example is um, First Man, which is probably if I was to create like a 
20, like a history movie of 2018, I would say that would be up on like very high on the list. How they got all the costumes right, they got all the all all the history elements. You know, they got that down. But on top of that, they told an interesting story about what it meant to be human, and also like what it meant to be like what did the space what the space race mean to the to the individual involved in that program. So for me, if it, that's kind of what I kind of think of it. And for the most part, if we're just kind of go off and I'll end this right now, and we'll go to the questions right now. Um, I will say that for the most part, um, the last tiger succeeded. I mean, it did very well in um, providing a a a story within the Second World War that's accurate. I would say to a certain degree, while maybe some of its surface elements are not totally accurate. Um, or maybe there's some things that don't really make sense within the story level. Um, for the most part, I I, I, agree. I think that um, the last Tiger did an amazing job, and I and I really do enjoy it. Um, so in that sense, that's kind of how I'll, I'll end that, that aspect of it. So now I'm going to get into the question. So all these questions, all these comments are not in order. I chose it in order basically what I think is interesting, and we can kind of uh, kind of talk more about military history in general or would it feels like being combat? So let's go first. So first comment, uh, this should have been said earlier, but the tiger wasn't made for urban combat and it's losses almost, and it loses, and it loses almost all of its advantages because of it. Well, um, I would first say that um, no tank is really made for urban combat. Uh, while they can be used in urban areas if they're closely supported by infantry, it is like not their most effective space in a sense. As there's enough, not enough room to maneuver, and they can easily be outflanked by infantry with rockets and mines hiding in, you know, buildings and debris and things of that nature. So this idea is also supported by uh, Kendall D. Gott in his book uh, *Breaking the Mold: Tanks in the Cities*, where he says that um, narrow streets are ideal ambush sites, and the risk of high casualties is great. Rarely is there a swift and sure outcome. In cities, the enemy often chooses to mix with with the civilian population. Heavy firepower is often counterproductive, as resulting rubble makes fighting positions even more formidable. So, in that sense, he talks about how, just, well, just kind of, let's go back a little bit. So, in this book, he's trying to talk about how tanks can be used in urban areas, because essentially the combat spaces in the in the 21st century are becoming more and more urbanized, mainly because that's where insurgency is like to, like to basically operate in. Because that's kind of like that's like their best suitable area. But what he is saying that um, on without any kind of changes within tech, like base, well, it, so he's basically saying that without any changes in tactics, that's kind of the problems with having tanks in urban areas. Um, and the tactics he's kind of talking about before were kind of really developed in the Second World War. So as we all know, the Germans were probably some of the best tank builders in the Second World War, at least the, more, the most advanced uh, tank builders in the Second World War, and kind of create a lot of the doctrine which uh, like the Allies kind of build upon, or, you know, so um, the biggest one being uh, Blitzkrieg. So he talks about um, how the Germans kind of ran into this problem first in terms of dealing with uh, tanks fighting in urban areas. So he says in 1941, as the Soviets adopted the tactic of holding on to their large cities and forcing the Germans to attack into them, uh, the epic battle of Stalingrad is one example that cost the Germans dearly in manpower and armored vehicles. In 1943 through 44, it was America's turn to learn firsthand the horrors of urban combat on a large scale as Jewish soldiers advanced through Italy and France and Germany. In these offenses, uh, the Germans chose to fight from cities, forcing the Americans to attack into them. Uh, the lessons were grim and reinforced the axiom that it was far better to avoid city fighting if possible. This is reflected by tank design toward the end of the war as it departed from the infantry support role, by then all sides of the conflict developed and fielded tanks suited for tank-on-tank -tank fights. This emphasis continued unabated for 60 years. Um, I have another point to make on this, but I'll kind of, uh, I'll kind of talk about what I was talking about before. So essentially what he's saying is that in the Second World War, Tanks were not made for urban combat because of all the problems that they ran into. Now, of course, in this book, he's talking about how if you change the tactics or introduce new tactics and how you use tanks within urban areas, you know, these things can be um, 
you know, dealt with. And like, these problems can be dealt with. But I will say, though, is that when I was talking about um, things that people who are involved in planning military strategy or having to develop tactics and things of nature, um, this is the type of stuff that they really look at and read because it's something that they didn't know for their job. For the common person who's not in that, I can't see how they can really deal with it and, you know, how can they really, like, do much with it. And then also within that as well, I've taken a bunch of this kind of, and this kind of idea kind of enforces something that I've experienced was um, I had actually had the opportunity at UC Davis to take a class on the Second World War. And we rarely talked about these types of things. Like... We, we talked more about the Holocaust. We talked more about the, um, uh, you know, the American um, war machine that was built up and the effects of that. Um, we talked a lot more about those things than we did about tactics and battles and things of that nature. And I think the reason why is because most universities, like most public universities like that, uh, like Davis, um, don't see what type of information, what type of knowledge can they get from these types of uh, lessons um, and I can kind of see that because if I was someone who was not interested in military tactics in that nature um, I wouldn't really care in a sense but now if you tell me why these things are important how they affected you know larger um, ideas and larger concepts that kind of run through our world or maybe help create the world that we live in today I think that's something that can really capture the general populace and that's how military technology, military uh, history can be used in that sense. And at the same time, um, you can kind of tell uh, who is this kind of made for by the by the publishers. So in this, um, so if you look at publishers in history, um, uh, like a lot of your history publishers or like general history publishers are like um, like the Harvard or like um, Chicago University Publisher, you know, UC Davis Publishing, um, all these universities or Stanford Publishing Company or Press or whatever. Um, those are like for more general histories or what I'm kind of talking about is what more general populist, not general populist, but more like a general history and how it affects general history in a sense. You can tell that it's a, uh, a book that's made for like military readers or people who are involved in the military community um, by the, by the, uh, by the publisher. So in this case, the publisher is uh, Combat Studies Institute Press, which can right now tell me that this book was published for those people in mind. This is why there's a publisher like that. So, so next question um, or next comment. Are you talking about the allies blowing up the bridge? Because that would be counterproductive. If not, why the fuck didn't they wait until they until the tiger got to their side, assuming the tiger didn't break it with the weight. Um, so this comment is about um, the last scene in The Last Tiger where the tank is about to, or the, our crew and our uh, protagonist is about to get across the bridge with his crew. Before they get on the bridge, the tank is blown up. And But what I can tell from the, the way the explosion happened, it seemed like it was a charged explosive. So there was already... Um, it, it was already rigged to explode before and basically blew up. Probably from the Germans, or it was probably from the Germans. <clears throat> so this is what that comment is talking about, and so why I didn't say anything about it. So when I made that first, when I made that comment in the video, I knew the bridge was gonna blow up. I didn't know by who. Um, I wasn't really thinking about who at that point. I just know at the if I was to make a um, a story or a plot, I just knew that would be the best way to kind of uh, make the plot more interesting in a sense. So. Um, who blew? So basically, if it was the Germans, uh, why didn't they wait until the tiger got to their side? Well, there's I have some ideas. So maybe the Germans didn't know the tiger tank was still on their side, or maybe someone messed up and set the charge way too early, or something happened with the charges and exploded early. I mean, mistakes like this happen in war all the time, and uh. And to be fair, this is something that is apparent within war as a concept and as a human activity. And if you guys have had the opportunity to read Karl von Clausewitz's On War, um, Karl von Clausewitz was a colonel who fought against Napoleon Bonaparte. And then uh, when Prussia um, sued for peace in 1805, I believe, 
I don't have the correct date on me right now. Um, he then went to join the Russians and fought against Napoleon as a Russian commander. And then when the Prussians rejoined the war, uh, he then joined uh, the Prussian army and went to fight against Napoleon. And he had created a book called On War. And um, it's actually one book of seven. Um, and in this book, he talks about like basically what is war as a concept and what does it mean to like you know, basically, what is war, essentially? And if you're to talk about war in a face about anything, uh, you have to have you have to have like, an idea of what Karl von Clausewitz is saying. So when he talks about the uh, nature of war, this is from Book One. One of the aspects of war, um, I would kind of read out some uh, quotes from this book. He's one of the uh, first quote is, "Only one element is needed to make war a gamble: chance." The very last thing that war lacks, no other human activity is so continuously or universally bound up with chance. And, and through the element of chance, guesswork, and luck comes to play a great part in war. Another thing he says, in short, absolute so-called mathematical factors never find a firm basis in military calculations. From the very start, there is interplay of possibilities, uh, probabilities, good luck, and bad that weaves its way through, throughout the length and breadth of its tapestry. In the whole range of human activities, war most closely resembles a game of cards. Uh, war is a realm of uncertainty. Three quarters of factors of which war is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or less uncertainty. A sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for these skills. Certainty. If we now consider briefly the subject of nature of war, which means by war, which by which war has to be fought, it will look more than ever as a gamble. Four elements make up the climate of war, danger, exertion, uncertainty, and chance. So what I'm saying is that essentially these guys could have fallen to bad luck. I mean, these things happen in war. Um, during the Battle of Leipzig, um, they just kind of give an idea of what, you know, these mistakes or whatever. Um, during the last day of the battle, um, Napoleon was uh, retreating uh, from the battlefield, and so he needed to get across a bridge. Um, so this, so as he was getting the last of the troops off the bridge, um, he basically a I don't know if it was a sergeant or somebody like that. Um, they were uh, given the job of blowing up the bridge, but um, he had messed up. And he actually set the charges, he actually set the fuse too early and blew up the bridge before all of Napoleon's army could get across the bridge and um, killed a lot of men who were on the bridge. So these things happen in war, and that's a possible reason why it could have happened. So, and if we look at Clausewitz, uh, mistakes, uh, luck, bad luck, good luck, um, fog, wrapped in a fog of very less uncertainty, it's a part of war. And so in that sense, um, it's definitely a possible bi possibility that those things could have happened. Next comment. Holy shit, are those Americans stormtroopers? Hashtag stormtrooper hackers. Um, well, I would say that um, in, in this comment, he's referring, they're referring to the uh, um, the fact that um, the American soldiers are bad, have bad shots. Uh, first, I would say this probably because it's a video game. Uh, but interestingly enough, there is some historical accuracy um, to this aspect of the game. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, comes from the book Act of War, The Behaviors of Men in Battle by Richard Holmes, where he tries to describe how it felt to be in battle during the modern age. So I'll read you some aspects of what he says. So first off, he talks about the um, this idea that you know, soldiers kill, whenever time a soldier shoots the gun, they have a high probability of actually killing them. So in this first... Uh, so this, so he first brings up, he first starts off with um, kind of debunking this. So I guess a good good place to start for him is um, he talks about how this this concept of soldiers being accurate in battle is very incorrect. Not only incorrect, but there's it's kind of hard to support in a sense. And that began with the Pointic Wars um, because they were using muskets essentially. And as we all know, the muskets was the musket was a very inaccurate weapon because it wasn't rifled. Um, and even though weapons got more and more, um, you know, advanced and with more advanced sights and rifling and things of that nature, um, soldiers were still inaccurate with the weapons. And the best thing that shows this 
is um, he talked about the uh, First World War. So in this case, the uh, British Expeditionary Force of 1914, uh, which is often regarded as a very upper, uh, very apogee um, of skill of arms and its performance at Mons, certainly most surprising to the Germans. So the British Expeditionary Force was probably the most um, efficient um, force um, in terms of weaponry because a lot of these guys were um, professional soldiers. They were not actually conscripts, so they were... Um, they had lots of opportunities to shoot their rifles and things of that nature. So, yeah. So, he talks about how um, how accurate these guys were. So, um, according to Walter Bolum, who was uh, was the only company commander in the battle battalion to survive the action um, at Mons, which was one of the first actions that the British and Germans were in. Oh, one of the first actions that the British were involved in. He's, uh, Walter Bolum would say... Uh, we're going to say that in our company alone, he wrote, we lost five officers and half of our men. So then Richard Holmes was going to say, um, but this sort of damage was inflicted as much by the volume of British fire as by its accuracy. Individual soldiers often fired all the one or 20 rounds they carried with them, and frequently much more. On the 23rd of October, for example, Private J.S. Barton of the Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire's uh, fired 600 rounds and his platoon shot his, its entire first line supply of ammunition. Much of it at ranges of, 200, of under 200 yards. Uh, Holmes will go on to continue by saying, um, Some noise in his particular actions caused a few casualties. On the night, on the night of, of 25th or 26th, uh, August, uh, 20, three companies of 3rd Battalion, the Coltrane Guards, the 2nd Battalion, the Grenadier Guards, supported by a single howitzer of 60th Battery, Royal Field Artillery, by a, was attacked, or, were attacked in a little French town of Landris by a German battalion. The battle went on for perhaps two hours, and the British believed that they had killed or wounded 800 to 900 Germans. Uh, the Germans, in fact, reported their own losses at 127 men. So what we can see here is that even though the German, the, the basically um, these uh, the Culture Guard and Second Battalion uh, Grenadier Guards. Um, they basically fired so much ammunition that the battle went on for two hours. And so they believed that they had killed 800 uh, or 900 Germans, but in reality they'd only uh, killed 127 men. So we can see this idea that um, the, people, the soldiers who were considered the most um, you know, marksman-like uh, force that we'd seen in modern warfare... We can see that's totally uh, not the case. And so, and if we continue going further, uh, the author goes on to say, in early November 1914, Second Grenadiers um, held a sector uh, in what was fast becoming the Yerps, Yerps uh, salient. The battalion was subject to a series of fierce and determined attacks, which in a few cases reached its lines. Repeated assaults during a long day's fighting left 300 Germans dead in front of the company position. In a similar action fought a few days later, the same company fired 24,000 rounds. If one increased the German casualty figure by adding 300 seriously wounded and 300 lightly wounded, which were very roughly the, which were very roughly the rates prevailing at the time, and assume that 24,000 round, rounds were consumed to afflict these casualties, then the Grenadiers were obtaining one hit for every 26 to 20 for every 26 rounds fired. The Grenadiers um, were consumed to inflict these casualties. Then the Grenadiers were obtaining one hit for every 26 rounds fired. The other continues on by saying that these calculations are all decidedly rough and ready. He goes on to say that I use them to, Holmes goes on to say, um, use them, he uses them to illustrate, uh, not to prove. They do, though, give an indication of the large numbers of rounds that even well trained regular infantry might have fired in order to get, in order to hit, uh, not necessarily kill an enemy. So now you might be asking yourself, well, why is that the case? Or why aren't soldiers, um, you know, why aren't they more accurate in a sense? Well, the reason why is because um, war is chaotic. War is loud. War is freaking crazy. Um, Holmes kind of says this in a, in a very interesting, in a very good way. Uh, this vast, if surprisingly ineffective volume of fire and the noise associated with it is an essential ingredient in the stress of battle. It helps turn real battle into something which has little in common with simulated with a simulated battle of training. Battles of training. We have already observed the tendency of historians to impart uh, to battle an order that rarely exists. 
The sheer disorganization of battle is at one and the same time the result of pressures produced by hostile file, hostile fire, and a contributor in its own right to battlefield stress. So essentially, what he's saying is that battle is chaotic mess, and that even the most trained soldiers cannot um, be 100% effective tools of war because of what war kind of creates. So in the end. Um, this idea that the American soldiers um, are inaccurate is pretty much just the mold. And if we were to look even more deeply into history, if you guys have had the opportunity to read Eugene Sledge's book with the old breed, uh, Okinawa and Pelu, um, you would know that um, by the end of war, um, Eugene Sledge talks about how, uh, like in 1944 and 1945, how most of the men who are getting drawn into his, uh, his unit are actually conscripts with only a couple weeks of training. And Eugene Slash talks about how, like, you know, they had gone like really good training where they're prepared for combat. Well, these conscripts didn't really have the time to, to get that type of training in. So if we're gonna take that line of thinking, um, we're dealing with mostly soldiers being conscripts um, who only have a few uh, weeks of training or boot camp essentially. And then you mix in um, the realities of what war is. Um, you can kind of see how we can kind of we can kind of see how that kind of that 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 idea or, or that criticism kind of stands up to when historical accuracy in a sense that it is possible that American soldiers can be missing that many shots. So um, that's all I will say on that. So these next few I'll just kind of rope all together and talk about. Uh, most of these were kind of about, uh, well, first off, uh, the next comment is, uh, no, Jew Jews were used to justify their problems, not why they went to war. Um, so I agree, and I I never said that in my review. If I did, I missed book. I couldn't find where I did say that. Um, but yes, that is totally correct. And this com this also comment also goes with another comment that was made um, by Yeet uh, Myskeet1, um, where he goes to say, they need to land and food for its people, dumbass. Um, so I've already kind of touched on these things, but I'll just kind of give like my review of these. They just, I guess more in detail or just kind of re rephrase it in a sense, what I said. So no, um, the reason why the Germans went to war in the Second World War is because um, during the 20s and uh, 30, or during the 20s, 30s, um, Adolf Hitler was uh, developing his viewpoint of the world and would be known in his book uh mein kampf and in that book um he believed that it was germany's right to kind of rule over europe not only that that they must kind of uh get revenge on the uh on the french for all the reversals that happened for pretty much all the bad things that happened after the first world war with all the, you know the humiliation um having to pay uh uh, indemnities for the conflict for the First World War, um, the, for the creation for the Rhineland for the for France holding the Rhineland, the demilitarized zone, and just like a national humil humiliation, and that's what a lot of um, French. I mean, so that's a lot. Of, that is what a lot of German um, Germans felt um, after the First World War, and so at the same time, he also wanted this idea was called Lebensraum. Or living space, and what he believed that was necessary way for the German, uh, you know, the the German Reich, or the uh, or the Aryan master race that uh, the land needed for the Aryan master race to kind of grow and you know make Germany better essentially. Um, so those were the main reasons why they went to war. Uh, again, I said before, um, if we were, if we were to talk about the fact that they needed food, land, and food. Um, Germany has simulations that really need all those items because, well, one, uh, it was probably one of the it was probably one of the largest uh, states in Europe, made next to France, and also, um, you know, for the most part, um, Germany had recovered um, by 1936. If we we're to talk about the uh, the 20s and 30s, while well, in the 20s Germany did face um, some financial issues, in reality, they didn't really have to pay that many loans. In by the late 20s. Uh, the United States had actually wiped out their loans, so they didn't have to pretty much pay for it anymore. And then um, in the early 30s, uh, pretty much everybody, including Germany, um, maybe except France, um, were suffering the effects of the Great Depression. So that's large amounts of uh, unemployment, 
you know, money is not worth as much. But by 1936, like I said before, uh, Germany had made a full economic recovery. And I mean, even host the Olympics, there's a lot of footage that shows that, you know, Germany is a bustling modern uh, economy during that time. At least that's what Hitler wanted to portray. <clears throat> and so in that sense, um, so in, like I said before, they already had, uh, if I didn't say before, uh, they had the resources. I mean, if you look at the Ruhr uh, region, or Ruhr Valley, um, that's where Germany is rich in coal, which allows them to produce a lot of factories, which allow them to gain a very big um, lead, or not lead, but at least get close to the British in terms of industrialization um, during the late uh, 19th century. Um, and also, I would also ask the question of uh, why was a devastating world war necessary? Because essentially, if you read Clausewitz, um, war is uh, basically diplomacy by other means. And um, also, why would you need a devastating war to get food and land if Germany already has that stuff? And if Germany actually did need it, um, how could you possibly go to war if you need food? Because a lot of wars, especially the total wars of the modern era, are built off if a nation is structurally um, structured, structurally um, stable to uh, produce a positive outcome in a conflict. And so if Germany was dealing with those things, why, how could they even go to war? And then just beyond that, um, I think it would be cheaper if, it would probably be cheaper if Germany got its food from trading and by importing it. Like for the United States, who was and is still one of the largest grain producers in the world, or like Canada, which is like known for its beef and cattle and things like that, interesting enough. Um, yeah, just if war, yeah, so I find that to be kind of weird and just doesn't make any sense. But I would say that if Hitler and his, uh, so I don't see how, so I don't see how large devastating war would uh, be necessary to get those things. But I would say that if Hitler and his Nazi forces were wanting to create their vision of the world, then I guess a devastating and uncompromising war was uh, necessary. And at the same time, um, you know, Fighter also talks about how um, Hitler was able to kind of hold on to, um, basically he was able to convince Germans, and I'll kind of add more to it, um, to what he said before, but basically the reason why Hitler was able to kind of convince Germans um, that his way was the right way um, was the fact that, um, was basically due to the fact that he was a great orator and he was great at, you know, speaking, uh, public speaking that was able to rile up the people and he was able to kind of touch on uh, items that a lot of uh, uh, Germans uh, cared about, which was like the economy and the reasons for why um, why the Germans are in a very terrible state. And also helped that they had a man like uh, Joseph Goebbels, who was the main propaganda leader. And he was a master at manipulating uh, public opinion with his different forms of uh, propaganda, like movies or um, speeches that were written, things of that nature uh, by him, and just different uh, propaganda campaigns that he did. And so with those two things and, um, you know, great, uh, great military, uh, <clears throat> also the fact that he was also able to uh, produce a lot of positive things for Germany, uh, if you're looking just at Germany in general, like they were able to, um, <clears throat> you know, the German economy was very strong by 1936, like I said before, but the main reason for that was because the Germans had um, rebuilt their, uh, um, their war machine, in a sense, to begin uh basically to begin world conquering or the world domination that, or not world domination, but at least European domination. And then after, so basically that allowed Hitler to gain a lot more legitimacy in his government. And then of course, after uh, successful um, invasions of Poland and France and uh, <clears throat> Belgium and the Netherlands, um, that gave him more legitimacy to begin what would be known as the final solution. Because according to Hitler, you needed to get rid of the Jews because uh, they were the problems for why Germany uh, lost the Fertile War, and they don't need, they're not a necessary uh, part of, uh, of the Third Reich, and that to clear out the um, people who live in Eastern Europe, uh, like the Slavs, um, to make room for the Germans that would populate that region. Um, so those are many reasons why uh, they went to, Germany went to war in the Second World War. 
<clears throat> so that's my responses to you guys' comments. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys got some clarity into how I view history and kind of my take on this video and everything particular to that. Um, and I'll probably add a lot more um, depth to this conversation in the comment section. And I'll probably be answering more questions in, your com in the comment section of this video and in the description as well. Things I couldn't say or things that really didn't make sense in the, in the, in the context of this video. So if you guys enjoyed it, um, please like and subscribe if you guys enjoyed it. If you guys have questions, comments for me, definitely put it in the comments. Um, please be nice if you can. So if you guys like the video, please like, subscribe. If you guys have questions, definitely put that in the comment section. I'll try to get to them as much as possible. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys later. Peace out.